Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the disinvited talk at this European Congress by Stuart White uh, from the University of Oxford. Stuart received his PhD in 2006 from the University of Edinburgh. And then after spending a postdoc year in Texas, he returned to Scotland to a position at the University of Glasgow, where he was for 12 years from 2007 and 2019. And towards the end of that time, I also moved to Scotland and had the opportunity to work with him on an editorial board and just as colleagues in the Scottish mathematical community. Unfortunately, or fortunately for him, certainly, unfortunately for us, uh, Stuart moved to Oxford in 2019 to a chair as professor of mathematics and tutorial fellow at St. John's uh, College. He's won a lot of accolades in, in his career. He was awarded the Sir Edmund Whitaker Memorial Prize of the Edinburgh Mathematical Society in 2013 and an Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Fellowship for experienced researchers between 2015 and 2018. Where, through which he visited the University of Münster for 16 months overall. He his work uh, focuses on operator algebras and related fields, and you'll see his, his, the title of his talk is Structure and Classification of Simple Amenable Sistar Algebras. He's particularly interested in the interface between the measurable and topological objects in this um, setting. Stuart has left Scotland, but he's still coming, I think, because he's a very keen hill climber. So we see him when he passes through whizzing, going towards his mountains. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be introducing Stuart to you. And I'll, uh, I'll soon let him have the floor. Just before I do that, I want to say that, please, if you have questions during or at the end of the talk, put them in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and depending on how we're doing for time, I might unmute you to ask your question in person or I will have to convey it. it, it we'll see how it goes, but please put any question or comments you have in the chat. Thank you very much. And I welcome Stuart White to the virtual Blackboard. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction and thank you to the uh, scientific committee and the organizers uh, of this meeting, not only for organizing the meeting uh, once, but for organizing it twice and in this uh, fantastic virtual format. So I want to tell you about the structure and classification of simple amenable C-star algebras. So these are of course uh, operator algebras, which is the sort of place in mathematics where we consider all operators or families of operators on the Hilbert space at the same time. So the bounded operators on the Hilbert space have both algebraic structure, that of a star algebra, we can add, compose, and take adjoints of operators, as indicated uh, on the slide, and also analytic structure, the norm of an operator measures how much uh, an operator amplifies the size of vectors. And these structures interact through this sort of uh, famous but innocuous looking C star ide identity, which is quite easy to prove for a bounded operator on the Hilbert space, but carries an enormous amount of rigidity uh, with it. So operator algebras come in two flavors. Uh, Beatrice mentioned them in the introduction. There's these von Neumann algebras and these Seaster algebras. And you can define them in a kind of cheating way by uh, taking closed uh, subalgebras of B of H, which are either closed in norm or closed in pointwise topology in the strong operator topology. So if you're meeting these for the first time or you're uh, and bringing back memories, you can imagine like meeting two children in the playground and their brothers and sisters. And, and, and as you first see them, they look very, very similar. But as you get to know them better, you realize that the personalities are quite different. And that's what's happening here, that the personality of our Caesar algebras is topological, whereas our von Neumann algebras uh, are much more measure theoretic in nature. And this can be seen both through the structure of their commutative uh, algebras, the commutative Caesar algebras by a theorem are all continuous functions on some locally compact Hausdorff space X, vanishing at infinity, whereas commutative von Neumann algebras are essentially bounded measurable functions on some measure space. Uh, and this topological and measure theoretic nature passes from the commutative to the sort of general flavor that pervades the study of operator algebras. So the other titles in the uh, parts of the title was the word structure and classification. So 
Uh, by classification, I really mean something that's sort of ubiquitous to large areas of mathematics. I, I want to decide when two of our operator algebras are the same up to isomorphism, just as we might classify compact orientable surfaces by their genus. And we want to do so through examples, uh, through invariants that we can compute and get our hands on in natural examples. So that somehow is the classification side. The structure side is, is a counterpart to classification. So classification theorems inevitably are gonna have hypotheses. And I'd like those hypotheses to be testable in examples to abstractly identify the classes that we can classify. And then of course, to come back and, and reap all of the benefits from classification. So this uh, talk is on the structure of Seastra algebras and the classification there, but it's just incredibly inspired by work in von Neumann algebras. So in the von Neumann algebraic setting, uh, Murray and von Neumann, when they really pioneered the field, proved a uniqueness theorem for a certain von Neumann algebra that we'll see later in the talk. And this is a very deep and profound theorem, but the hypotheses on it aren't so easy to test. And it was only 30 years later where Alan Kahn came along and amongst other things, showed that in sort of operator algebraic abstractization of amenability for groups, can identify the conditions in Murray von Neumann's theorem and, and hence make this classification result much more accessible uh, than it previously was. And, and this uh, result really ch changed the landscape uh, of uh, von Neumann algebras um, and all of their applications in, in other areas of mathematics. So you know how it is, right? Uh, when the older child has done something and the younger child sees it happen, the younger one just has to do it as well. And, and that's sort of the quest that the C-star algebra community has had uh, over um, a time period now of 45 uh, plus years, the so-called Elliott classification program uh, driven uh, heavily by George Elliott, which is a large scale project designed to seek the analogous results for Seaster algebras uh, as one has from this Con uh, Murray von Neumann uh, classification and structure of von Neumann algebras. And the work represents um, work of many researchers uh, over decades. Uh, I can't give uh, justice to everybody during the talk, uh, so I'm not going to attribute uh, results as cleanly as I, I would normally do. Uh, and really the main result should be viewed as belonging to our community of researchers uh, at large. And, and I'll try and be more precise in the written version of this talk uh, in the conference proceedings. So let's have some examples to carry through this talk. So one way you can build operator algebras is if you put things on a Hilbert space, you can take the family of operators that they generate. So whenever you have a representation of a mathematical object on a Hilbert space, you'll get an operator algebra. So unitary representations of groups will give operator algebras. And I want to look at this cross product construction where we build operator algebras from group actions. Uh, for me, G will be a discrete group, uh, countable as well, acting on a space. And maybe that space will be compact Hausdorff in which case the action will be by homeomorphisms, or maybe it'll be a measure space and we act by non-singular uh, bijections. And depending on the flavor, we either get a Seaster algebra on the topological side or a von Neumann algebra on the measurable side. And these are generated by copies of the function algebra, C of X or L infinity of X, which I'm viewing as multiplication operators. Hence, I've chosen to write it as capital M sub F, as well as a unitary representation of the group inside this algebra, uh, C of X cross G or L infinity of X cross G. So it comes with unitaries US with US times UT is UST. And the key point is that these unitaries now implement the action. Because G acts on X, G will also act on the function algebra by means of uh, composition in this way, F is getting sent to F composed alpha S uh, inverse for a group element S. And now this inner automorphism of the large algebra C of X uh, cross G given by this unitary US implements the action uh, of G on this subalgebra uh, C of X. So it should be very reminiscent of the semi-direct product construction for groups, uh, where you, you start with a group acting by automorphisms uh, on another group and build a larger group containing both and containing the action. 
For the experts in the room, I'm doing the reduced cost product um, and I've chosen to suppress that detail. And I've also written down concretely how you could build this as Hilbert space operators. But this isn't really important. The idea is that um, the, we have this way of going from an, a group action and building an operator algebra. And then we want to ask the sort of question to the form like, well, what does the operator algebra tell you about the group action? What does the group action tell you about the operator algebra? How much rigidity? is there in this construction? And those questions go back uh, at least to the 40s and the introduction of this construction. So that's the driving example I'd like you to carry around. Let me have some examples of the example. So if you take X to be the singleton uh, one point set, the algebra of functions will be the scalars, the complex numbers, and we get the group Seaster algebras and von Neumann algebras, again, the reduced group Seaster algebra for the experts. And this is generalizing the Fourier transform. In the case where G is abelian, the group Seaster algebra is the continuous functions on the Fourier dual group, it has to be the continuous functions on something, and it's the Fourier dual group that turns up, and the group von Neumann algebra, the uh, essentially bounded uh, measurable functions. So if you put in the integers, the Fourier dual group is the circle, and we see that the group C algebra with the integers is the continuous functions on the circle, group von Neumann algebra with the integers, the L infinity functions on the circle. Group C star algebras of the uh, integers squared, therefore gives us the continuous functions on the torus, but topology sees the difference between the circle and the torus, and, and hence the difference between these two commutative C star algebras and these groups have different group C star algebras. Measure theory, of course, uh, the circle and the torus are measurably the same. The von Neumann algebra associated to Z uh, is isomorphic to the von Neumann algebra associated to Z squared. And this is an example of an important piece of phenomena that, you know, Seaster algebras, if we pass from Seaster algebra to its von Neumann closure, we may well lose uh, information. We may find unexpected isomorphisms uh, arising. So that's an example of an action where, where really there was no action. So an action where there is an action, uh, well, of course, there's, there's huge numbers of examples here, and, and I've chosen really one of the most famous, which is uh, that of irrational rotation on the circle. So my group is the integers. It's acting on the circle by irrational rotation, uh, by some irrational angle theta, giving rise to a von Neumann algebra and a Seaster algebra. And, and you can try and use these to think about the quotient space uh, of X uh, under this action. And spoiler alert, the von Neumann algebra won't remember the theta and to some extent the Seaster algebra uh, will. So that's the sort of thing that can happen. Let me give you an, uh, another example, uh, one of perhaps at first sight slightly more of an internal nature, which is I can build my Seaster or von Neumann algebras as inductive limits. I can put the two by two matrices inside the four by four matrices, inside the eight by eight matrices, all as shown. Uh, and in this way, the union of these in the algebraic sense will be a star algebra because each of these inclusion maps is a star homomorphism. And so uh, if I can put that star algebra on a Hilbert space, I can then close it up and form either a group C star algebra or a group uh, von Neumann algebra. Uh, sorry, a Seaster algebra and a von Neumann algebra uh, as the closure of this star algebra uh, obtained from A. Now, A has one more piece of information I'd like to bring to your attention in that not only because it got this star structure, but it's also got a, a trace. So because the normalized traces on the two by two matrix is compatible with the normalized trace on the four by four matrix under this embedding, if I carry on in this way, I'll be able to make a well-defined trace on the union, and that'll be a linear function satisfying the trace identity that we're familiar with, and trace of one is one. And when I perform this construction and representation of this algebra A on a Hilbert space, I want to do so so that the trace extends to the norm closure, giving me this Seaster algebra, which I'm denoting M2 infinity, the algebra of canonical anti-commutation relations from mathematical physics, and its von Neumann closure are um, the so-called hyperfinite 2-1 factor. And again, the notation is supposed to be a bit suggestive. So the M2 infinity, there's a, there's a 2 in the notation I'm using, and so I'm hinting at the fact that this uh, is remembered, 
whereas uh, the von Neumann algebra R, ah, the, the two has disappeared. And, and on the von Neumann side, the size of the matrix doesn't play a role in the resulting um, algebra that we get. Okay, so that's a load of examples uh, to be considering. So now I'm in, in position to give a hint at what these structure and classification theorems uh, look like. So Murray and von Neumann's theorem from 1945 says that that inductive limit on the previous slide is essentially unique in the von Neumann situation. So precisely, there should be a unique von Neumann algebra, which is infinite dimensional as a vector space, so we're not allowing a finite dimensional uh, object, but arises as an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras, as in the previous example. So you can, for example, approximate a finite family of operators in the strong operator topology from a finite dimensional uh, subalgebra. And then uh, it should also be simple as a von Neumann algebra, so having no closed two-sided von Neumann ideals, and have this trace, which is a sort of measure of finiteness for a von Neumann algebra. These last three conditions, infinite dimensional, simple with a trace, this is the definition of being a so-called two-on factor, and these are one of the sort of fundamental building blocks in the theory of von Neumann algebras. I should say in concrete examples, these are all relatively easy to check, the infinite dimensionality, the simplicity, uh, and the trace. The hyperfiniteness is only easy to check directly if it's really staring at you in the face. So as in the previous example, this very much is an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras. You can see the hyperfiniteness. It's not so easy to see it in other examples. And indeed, if you start with the von Neumann algebra associated to a group, even though through Kohn's uh, powerful theorem, we know that this is going to be hyperfinite whenever the group is amenable, we have no way of seeing how the von Neumann algebra associated to an amenable group is hyperfinite um, in terms of formal sets. So what Kohn did um, some 30, 32 years later was show that an operator algebraic version of amenability for groups gives the abstract characterization of this condition of hyperfiniteness, um, which is now makes Murray and von Neumann's uh, classification theorem readily accessible in examples. So uh, I've given something that was first proved by Kohn that L infinity of X cross G is hyperfinite when G is amenable. Uh, that was later uh, obtained more concretely using ideas of Einstein and Weiss, but um, initially uh, due to Kohn, uh, that this is how we get uh, this algebra within the scope of classification. So what's happened really is it's the marriage of the structure theorem of Kahn and the classification theorem of Murray and von Neumann that changed the game. It's sort of really very difficult to overstate the importance of the theorems in the red box for subsequent developments in von Neumann algebra. So it led to the classification of hyperfinite von Neumann algebras without traces. And because we can build up von Neumann algebras um, as direct integrals of these simple von Neumann algebras. In fact, we completely understand all amenable von Neumann algebras. It's led to breakthrough results in measurable dynamics. It powers Jones's theory of subfactors, uh, Popper's deformation rigidity theory. It's frankly impossible to imagine work in von Neumann algebras, um, which doesn't use this result uh, pretty much on a daily basis, although sometimes somewhat implicitly. So that's the von Neumann algebra side of things. And I want to now talk a little bit about the, um, well, one aspect of Kohn's proof. So I want to flag up um, this little detail, which uh, will come up again later in the talk, that um, our inductive limit construction of R, I, I built it up by putting the two by twos inside the four by fours, but I could have thought of it as a representation of the infinite tensor product of the two by two matrices. And when I do that, of course, I can re-index this tensor product and put the even factors on the left and the odd factors on the right, and R will be isomorphic to its own tensor square. It's satisfying that it's a tensorial unit for itself. So it's like satisfying the equation x is equal to x squared, which normally has solutions just that x is 0 or 1. 
Well, in the setting of operator algebras, we have this non-commutative R, which is isomorphic to R tensor R. And the key step in Kohn's proof was going from this abstract notion of amenability to seeing that R acted as a tensorial unit on an arbitrary um, amenable 2-1 factor. So with that in place, I can now uh, look at the Seaster algebra's uh, situation. Uh, in this case, you can see the matrix size in the C star inductive limits. Um, the algebra M2 infinity is not isomorphic to the um, algebra uh, M3 infinity. Um, and the reason for this is that the trace of close projections um, has to be the same. And so if P and Q are norm close projections, I will not be able to approximate a projection of trace a half by a projection in the algebra of three to the n by three to the n matrices. Now that's a bit ad hoc, and making it less ad hoc, one should use K theory for Seaster algebras, which is a non commutative extension of Atiyah and Hertzabruck's uh, K theory for spaces. So the homology theory for spaces was ported, and you know, work out you work out how to define it for uh, abelian Seaster algebras C of X and then work out how to extend this to all uh, non-commutative Seaster algebras. It costs you something. K theory for spaces gives you a ring, whereas uh, the only thing that survives for non-commutative Seaster algebras is the abelian group structure. But otherwise, you get a really nice um, uh, theory, uh, now a uh, covariant functor. Uh, and in this way, you can see the K theory of M n infinity, and it's all um, integer, it's all rational numbers of the form R over N to the K. And you can view this as the difference in rank of projections in matrices over this algebra, where the trace is measuring the rank of the projections. So that's one of the ingredients that we want in order to classify our Seaster algebras. The other ingredient is, is kind of encoded in this um, this green box that we kind of wanted to see how the trace interacted with this K theory. And that uh, happens through looking at all traces on our Seaster algebra. So in that last example, because each M2 to the N, each matrix algebra has a unique trace, the inductive limit M2 infinity has a unique trace. But for general Seaster algebras, that's not going to be true. And there can be many traces on an arbitrary Seaster algebra. So if you take these cross products, which is very much motivating my talk, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these traces, bounded linear functions with trace of one is one, trace of xy is trace of yx, and invariant measures on x. And then the collection of all of these things can be quite big. It's compact and convex, but any showcase simplex can arise. So you've got this huge collection of non-commutative measures, which you're going to use to give rank functions on your K-theory. And those are the, it's the combination of traces and K-theory that I hope um, is uh, we can use to classify c algebras. So, for example, uh, the irrational rotation algebra by theta on the circle, all of the K0 groups as abstract abelian groups are the same, they're just Z plus Z. And it's through the pairing with the trace, the trace of K0 uh, applied to this uh, cross product, embeds this group Z plus Z as the concrete group of Z plus integer multiples of theta inside R, and sends the unit, the unit of A, which is a reserved element, and sends it to the class one. And from this information, we can fully understand our irrational rotation algebra. And we learn that two irrational rotation algebras associated to different angles are isomorphic if and only if the angles differ by an integer or one of the angle is uh, minus the other angle called modulo an integer. And so you see that the irrational rotation algebras remember up to reversing orientation, uh, the integer involved. Okay, so that's the, um, the invariant that we wish to use to classify our Seaster algebras. So now I want to talk about the, the classification uh, situation. Yeah, how, how many algebras can we classify by uh, K-theory and traces analogous to um, 
Conn and Murray von Neumann. And so this is the Elliott uh, classification program, which aims to really get the lot, all simple, separable, amenable Cster algebras, where amenability is an approximation property for Cster algebras, entirely mirroring the property that Conn is using um, in the setting of von Neumann algebras. So I've got this gray bubble here of all simple amenable Cster algebras, and I want to know when do k theory and traces classify them. And I've given you a tiny little red dot in the middle, these irrational rotation algebras, where I do know the k theory and the traces and the way that the k theory and traces interact classify these Cster algebras. So two Cister algebras in the red dot, here the irrational rotation algebras, same K-theory and traces are isomorphic. And what's happened since this conjecture was first mooted by George in the early 90s is, of course, uh, lots of research has been done and the size of the dot uh, has increased. There have been huge numbers of results in this direction. And sometimes it increased quite a lot. So there's this fabulous Kirchberg-Phillips theorem, uh, which really enlarge the class um, of the red dot, the classifiable class, uh, vastly all in one go. And the question is, how far does it go? Can we extend this classifiability zone out all the way to simple separable amenable Cster algebras, or do we have to stop somewhere? And if so, where do we stop? How do we decide whether we're classifiable or we're not classifiable? So that's what I want to talk about um, next, some ways of deciding whether you are classifiable or whether you're not classifiable. So although in the 90s, the, um, the headline news was the, the vast expansion of the size of the dot, the headline news in the 2000s was in the other direction. So there were some profound counterexamples worked out first by, I guess, Jasper Vilderson and then Mikhail Rodham. And the example I have on the slide is, is one of Andrew Tom's. So it says that there's a simple inductive limit of Cster algebras that really don't look too bad. So it's not an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebras like it was in the previous examples, but it's an inductive limit of matrix algebras over uh, Cster algebras of continuous functions on some spaces Xn. And you can perform such an inductive limit such that the, uh, the algebra you get A is simple and can't be distinguished from A tensor M to infinity by these k theory and traces. And neither can it be distinguished by adding countably many other homotopy invariant functors from Cster algebras into abelian groups. So you can't solve the problem by just adding a few, a few more nice invariants. If you want to separate A from this tensor product A tensor M to infinity, you really will have to use quite a technically uh, involved invariant that in practical examples will be hard to compute. So there is a boundary line. Um, we, we wanna push outwards, but we're not expecting if we want our classification theorem to be useful in practice to get all separable, amenable, uh, simple Cster algebras covered by a classification by k theory and traces. And the question I'm, I'm that the, you know, we, the field evolved into asking is like, where is this boundary, boundary line? What falls within the classifiable and what we should view as exotic? How do you decide uh, in a given example? So there's a number of different approaches to this. Um, from various different sort of uh, ways of looking at operator algebras. So very topological, much more functional analytic or much more uh, algebraic. From the topological side, it's really natural. You know, we've seen non-commutative algebraic topology in the K-theory for Cster algebras, but some of the more analytic aspects of topology also have non-commutative analogs. So we could look for a non-commutative version of covering dimension. This work was really heavily driven by uh, Wilhelm Winter. And this is the so-called nuclear dimension. What it is, is a covering dimension for Cster algebras. So it should extend the Lebesgue covering dimension for spaces in that the nuclear dimension of C of X is precisely the dimension of X and it should behave nicely 
with respect to natural uh, operations. Uh, and hopefully this gives us a way of dividing through dimension theory between the classifiable and the exotic. And it turns out that the counterexamples that I had on the previous slide, those counterexamples came from matrix algebras over spaces. For the counterexamples to work, the dimension of the spaces um, in terms of its covering dimension must grow much, much faster than the size of the matrix algebras. And it turns out that this inductive limit that's providing a counterexample will have to have infinite nuclear dimension. So the bad example, uh, at least on the previous slide, is infinite non-commutative uh, dimensional. Whereas in the positive direction, every possible K theory and trace pairing uh, of a simple separable unital Seaster algebra is going to be obtained by a Seaster algebra of nuclear dimension uh, one. And so if the Seaster algebras of finite non-commutative dimension should be classifiable, they also provide the boundary because every possible invariant is realized within the class. So you can't add anything that's outside the class of uh, finite nuclear dimension algebras if you're going to include the nuclear, finite nuclear dimension algebras inside the classifiable bubble. So that's one possible way you could try and divide the exotic from the classifiable. Another direction is to look at this tensor unit condition. This idea of the hyperfinite two one factor is isomorphic to its own tensor square. And we could ask ourselves, well, what is the simple Seaster algebra that's most analogous to the hyperfinite two one factor R? Is it the uh, algebra M2 infinity or the, the algebra M3 infinity? And both of those really are, are not canonical enough. There's a certain two-ness and freeness about those constructions that isn't really independent of choices that are being made. So maybe one should get rid of the, the presence of the two by tensoring together all of the um, infinite tensor products of all matrix algebras to form this algebra Q. Um, so that's the infinite tensor product actually from n is two to infinity of all matrix algebras mn and then closed up in Seaster algebras. But that, although it is canonical, is too big. Uh, the k theory of that algebra k0 will be the rational numbers q, which is why we're using uh, q to denote it. Uh, and so if you are absorbing q, then your k theory will have to be divisible by any natural number. And that's not always the case. So we're looking for a non-commutative version of the complex numbers that goes in the other direction, that's smaller than M2 infinity and M3 infinity. And that's the so-called Zhang Su algebra, uh, Z, uh, which is a unital Seaster algebra that's not the complex numbers, um, but somehow shares most of the other properties of the complex numbers. So it should have K theory, the same as the complex numbers. It should have a unique trace. And it should be finite dimensional from a topological point of view from this non-commutative uh, nuclear dimension. Uh, and indeed, it turns out that the dimension of Z uh, is a one-dimensional uh, algebra. A much harder result, um, first of all, it, it, you can write down this Jiangsu algebra explicitly. Um, I'm not going to do so because the, the definition in terms of an inductive limit is a little bit technical um, and not very illuminating if it's the first time you've seen it. Uh, but it does enable you to get this nuclear dimension estimate. Uh, but it becomes much harder to prove that Z is isomorphic to Z tensor Z, because morally the left-hand side, well, it is one-dimensional, but the right-hand side is morally two-dimensional. And so you've got to prove some form of non-commutative dimension reduction theorem in order to obtain such an estimate. But once you've done so, um, what will happen is that for any Seaster algebra A, because of this second bullet point in the green slide, the K theory and traces of A and of A tensor Z will be exactly the same. And so if both A and A tensor Z are classifiable by K theory and traces, well then A better be isomorphic to A tensor Z. So this is a second condition that gives you the potential boundary of that classifiable bubble. Uh, that A should be so-called Z-stable, i.e. isomorphic to its tensor product with this uh, Zhang Su algebra Z. Uh, 
And in a precise sense, said stability really is the minimal hypothesis of this nature you could make. Uh, and although it is difficult to define the Jiangsu algebra, the many different constructions of it all end up realizing the same thing. So something natural is really uh, going on behind the scenes. So with all that, I can now give you both the structure and the classification theorem for simple amenable Seaster algebras. So uh, the structure theorem tells you that those two potential boundary lines for classification coming from very different perspectives are in fact the same. So for simple separable amenable Seaster algebras, if you're not a matrix algebra, in which case you can't be stable under tensoring by Z because Z is infinite dimensional as a vector space. So if you exclude that case, finite nuclear dimension and Z stability are the same. And if you had quite high nuclear dimension in the first place, in fact, it collapses back down. The, the dimension is either gonna be zero or one. So either in the non-commutative situation for simple Seaster algebras, the dimension is zero, one, or infinity. And this gives us the threshold of what we can classify. So the classification theorem tells us that simple, unital, separable, and amenable, so these are all uh, analogous to the conditions that were easy to check for T1 factors, will be classified if they satisfy this Z stability or finite nuclear dimension condition, and if they satisfy a certain universal coefficient theorem condition that I will briefly discuss on the next slide. Uh, and then the k theory and traces completely classify uh, this, these collection of algebras. So it's the analog for Seaster algebras of the Murray von Neumann Kohn Hogger group classification of uh, amenable von Neumann factors. And it really does represent work of huge numbers of researchers uh, around the world gluing together um, yeah, papers attacking this problem from many different directions. Um, the UCT class here is a technical thing. It's satisfying a non-commutative universal coefficient theorem. And like any universal coefficient theorem, what it does is compute something that's difficult here, Kasparov's bivariant KK theory, in terms of something that's less difficult, namely K theory. And it's a major open problem whether all amenable Seaster algebras satisfy the UCT. So you might be tempted to say, well, that's a problem with the classification theorem because how are you verifying this in practice if the UCT uh, hypothesis still has to be um, established? But there are no candidate counterexamples to the UCT problem. And indeed, pretty much any nuclear or amenable Seaster algebra that you write down is known to have the UCT. So in concrete examples, if you can write it down explicitly, the UCT has typically already been worked out, normally through deep work on the Baumcon conjecture. So still a major and really important problem that I think deserves a lot more attention, um, but it's not a problem in terms of applying the classification theorem. Moreover, the range of the invariant, the total collection of all K theory and traces, these are understood. So that means that you can apply the classification theorem to prove results about arbitrary classifiable Seaster algebras by checking them in uh, a list of constructions that realize all K-theory and traces. And there've been some really nice uh, results in this direction. Um, Shin Li's, for example, demonstration that a classifiable Seaster algebra has a groupoid model uh, is one of those that I'd like to highlight. So um, let me end, therefore, by just talking through the state of the art of this classification theorem in the setting of the dynamical systems that I've had weave throughout the talk. So we had these uh, irrational rotation algebras, but you can imagine, for example, uh, the minimal diffeomorphisms on the uh, odd, odd dimensional spheres and many, many more. Um, cross products Easter algebras associated to an amenable group acting on a compact Hausdorff space. So when do they fall within the framework of the classification theorem? Well, the four adjectives in the middle, um, those are not so bad. So let me take separable uh, unital first. Unital is going to be automatic. All of these um, cross products are automatically unital and separability which is always going to be needed in order to run a back and forward type argument, that's going to follow from countability of G, metrizability of X. 
Um, so amenability, I see Beatrice is looking at me, so I will be wrapping up on li literally this, this slide. Amenability is um, that the um, follows from the group being amenable or more generally when the action is uh, amenable. So this is something that, of course, depending on the group, might be very, very difficult to test. If somebody gives you the Thompson group, you're not deciding uh, as an operator algebraist very quickly whether that group is amenable. But if you know things about your group, uh, then getting amenability of the Seaster algebra, that we can do. And always these examples fall in the UCT class um, via work of um, John Louis II, building on work of Higgs and Gasparov. So the adjectives separable, unital, amenable in the UCT class, they're all completely covered. I need simplicity in order to access classification. For this, there is a very nice sufficient condition that the action is minimal, that all orbits uh, of every point are dense. And of course, we see this in many natural examples, such as irrational uh, rotation algebras. So what remains is that Z stability finite nuclear dimension, that classification boundary line, should I view these cross products as being infinite dimensional or uh, finite dimensional in the non-commutative situation. And here is the state of the art, because this is itself an area that has been growing very, very quickly in the last couple of years. So if G is relatively small, so virtually nil potent, by Gromov's theorem, that's the same as of polynomial growth, and the space is finite dimensional, it turns out the cross product will always be a finite new. And the estimates here um, involve, again, quite a lot of work and, and come out with estimates that involve the Hirsch length of G, the dimension uh, of the space X, and certain um, asymptotic dimensions of core spaces associated to the construction. And then, of course, once you have the finite new dimension, the dimension then the end collapses to one, but you needed all of these estimates to get there. In general, when the dimension of X is finite, if you want to go past virtually nil potent, you'll need to use the Z-stability approach, the, the direct computation of nuclear dimension. There is no chance. And there have been really dramatic developments here in the last six months, uh, a year, um, for examples of non-virtually nilpotent groups for which all actions on all finite dimensional uh, spaces give rise to classifiable Seaster algebras. And it's very tempting to conjecture that this could hold for all amenable uh, groups G, but we're still a long way uh, off that as a community. And then what happens if the dimension of the underlying space is infinite? There too, we can get finite dimensional algebras. And there's a strong connection between um, the work of yeah, the work on Seaster algebras and notions of mean dimension zero uh, in ergodic theory. So uh, an example of a theorem, uh, this time by Elliot and New, is that if G is uh, the integers and they act on an infinite dimensional space, but of a, in a mean dimension zero fashion, then the cross product is Z stable and hence uh, finite new dimension and classifiable. So that's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for listening, and I will stop there.